Good afternoon, and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here, whether you're here in person or joining us on our YouTube channel. Before we hear from our guest speaker, Gerald Magliaca, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up next month. On Thursday, February 1st at 7 p.m., we'll partner with the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress for a program called Meet the Better Half, Congressional Partners, Spouses, and Families. And on Tuesday, February 6th at noon, Christine Carrison will be here to talk about her new book, Jefferson's Daughters, Three Sisters, White and Black, and a Young America, which looks into the lives of Martha, Martha and Maria Jefferson and Harriet Hemings. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our calendar of events at archives.gov, and you can also sign up to receive it um, by email or regular mail on the table outside. Another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities, and there are membership applications also in the lobby. Upstairs, our rotunda holds the Charters for Freedom, the original parchments of the three founding documents of our nation, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. When the Declaration and Constitution were transferred from the Library of Congress to the National Archives in 1952, and that's many years after this building opened, I want you to know, and the Librarian of Congress refused to give them up. It wasn't until 1952 that they finally made it into their um, home with great fanfare and ceremony. But we often overlook the fact that the Bill of Rights was already here. It came to the archives from the Department of State in 1932 and was put on view in the rotunda. During that 1952 ceremony, though, President Harry Truman drew attention to the already in the National Archives possession, saying, I'm glad that the Bill of Rights is at last to be exhibited side by side with the Constitution. These two original documents have been separated far too long. In my opinion, the Bill of Rights is the most important part of the Constitution of the United States, the only document in the world that protects the citizen against his government. The Constitution was ratified with a promise to add guarantees of personal liberties, and the first federal Congress took, that, took up that task. And once the states ratified the proposed amendments, the Bill of Rights became an integral part of the new United States Constitution. So now let's turn to Professor Magliocca to learn more about the Bill of Rights, the heart of the Constitution. In a recent Washington Post review, Kay Sybil Raymond wrote, in this timely new book, The Heart of the Constitution, Magliocca highlights how a key component of our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, has been a central touchstone for Americans throughout history. Magliarca is the Samuel R. Rosen Professor at Indiana University Robert H. McKinney School of Law. He's the author of four books and over 20 articles on constitutional law and intellectual property. He received his undergraduate degrees from Stanford and his law degree from Yale. He joined the Indiana Law Faculty after a year as a law clerk for Judge Guido Calabrese on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in two years as an attorney at Covington and Burling. In 2008, he held the Fulbright Dow Distinguished Research Chair of the Roosevelt Study Center in Middleburg, the Netherlands. He was elected to the American Law Institute in 2013 and in 2014 received Indiana University Trustees Teaching Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gerald Magliarca. Well, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, I want to uh, thank David and everyone here at the Archives uh, for hosting me today. I know they were rather busy earlier in the week, given the, uh, the shutdown. And so uh, I'm glad that everything worked out for me to be here today. Um, speaking of the shutdown, uh, I want to begin my remarks today by pointing out that the Bill of Rights is a symbol of unity uh, in an increasingly polarized America. And indeed, if I look out uh, in the audience, I see a, a good representation of, at least of those of you that I know, uh, liberals, libertarians, and conservatives. So, and I think that represents kind of our sort of feeling 
that we all share about the importance of the Bill of Rights in our constitutional culture. Um, now, when I um, began researching this project, I wanted to understand how, when, and why the first 10 amendments became special in American culture and in American law. And what I found was rather surprising. So that's part of what I want to share with you today. The title of the book comes from a statement by Justice Hugo Black, who was the first person to describe the Bill of Rights as the heart of the Constitution. Now, he did not do this in a Supreme Court opinion. He did it in a national radio address that he delivered in the fall of 1937, following revelations that he had once been a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, there were calls for Black to resign from the Supreme Court, to which he had just been confirmed. And uh, so he decided he needed to address the issue in a national speech. And his speech began by saying, our Constitution is the supreme law of the land. The Bill of Rights is the heart of the Constitution. Now, this was part of a rhetorical strategy that Black used in his speech to try to convince the country that he was not a bigot and that he would defend civil liberties as a member of the Supreme Court. And uh, as a political speech, it was quite successful because the calls for his resignation kind of faded away. And he proceeded to serve on the court for 34 years uh, and made great contributions in many areas of civil liberties uh, during that time. Now, black speech is emblematic of two themes in my book. The first is that the Bill of Rights as we understand it, did not become very important in American culture until the late 1930s and early 1940s, which is about the time that Black gave this address. Um, most Americans, until the 20th century, did not think that the first 10 amendments were a Bill of Rights and certainly did not think it was the Bill of Rights. So it is a modern understanding of an 18th century text. The second theme that I want to convey today that also is partly expressed by Justice Black's speech is that the definition and the meaning of the Bill of Rights has changed dramatically over time as people have used that idea for different political purposes of their own. Now, Justice Black talked about the Bill of Rights in his address in a particular way because he was trying to achieve a particular end, namely convincing people that he was fit to serve on the Supreme Court. Uh, and this is a pattern that we see uh, that recurs throughout American history. So, for example, the Anti-Federalists, who were against the ratification of the Constitution, called for the addition of a Bill of Rights to the document as a way of protecting states' rights, at least primarily. Uh, later on, though, advocates of extending the provisions of the first set of amendments to the actions of state governments, which lawyers call incorporation, were doing it and emphasizing the Bill of Rights to be an exception to states' rights. Now, as I'll talk about in some further detail in a moment, Franklin Roosevelt talked about the Bill of Rights as a way of justifying the expansion of the federal government during the New Deal and World War II. But right here, as you've just been told, at the National Archives, Harry Truman, during the Cold War, talked about the Bill of Rights as the thing that made our limited form of government different from the Soviet Union. Now, all of these different and, frankly, kind of inconsistent interpretations of the Bill of Rights are possible because the very idea of a Bill of Rights is flexible. Although, as I'll point out at the end of my remarks, this is something that we've kind of lost sight of in recent years. Okay, so let me go back to my first theme, right, which is that people did not think of the first 10 amendments as the Bill of Rights or a Bill of Rights until the 20th century. Um, now, this is an observation that was first made a few years ago by Pauline Mayer, who was a wonderful historian uh, who has since passed away and had, wrote terrific books on the Declaration of Independence and on the ratification of the Constitution. And... Uh, the observation is confirmed by the research that I did for this book. If you go and look at what was said between 1791 and the 1890s, roughly, uh, in any source that you want to look at, private letters, books, judicial opinions, debates in Congress, 
the media, uh, you find relatively few references to the first 10 amendments as the Bill of Rights, or a Bill of Rights, or a Declaration of Rights, I mean, any equivalent phrase. Now, indeed, James Madison, who drafted the provisions that became the Bill of Rights, never said that what was ratified in 1791 was a Bill of Rights or the Bill of Rights. Now, that's quite remarkable given that he lived for another, well, roughly 45 years and commented a lot on the Constitution and was justly proud of his role in drafting the Constitution in the Constitutional Convention, yet he never took authorship, if you will, of what we now call the Bill of Rights. And one conclusion that I reach in the book is that he didn't claim it because he didn't think it was true. He didn't think that what he had produced or what was ratified in 1791 was, in fact, a Bill of Rights. Uh, now, you could look at almost every major founding father or leading figure in America in the late 18th and 19th centuries, and you see the same thing. You never see George Washington talk about the Bill of Rights, or Abraham Lincoln, or John Adams, or John Marshall, or Alexander Hamilton, and on and on. Now, there are a few exceptions, and I, which I talk about in the book, but they're few and far between. So what did most people say about the amendments if they didn't call them the Bill of Rights or a Bill of Rights? Well, they just referred to them as the amendments, or they talked about a particular amendment that they, that were, they were interested in for one reason or another. Most people, I think it's fair to say, in America up until the end of the 19th century would have said either that we did not have a National Bill of Rights or if we did have one, they would have picked something other than the first 10 amendments. Now, here are some of the other candidates for the role of uh, Bill of Rights in this time period. One was the Declaration of Independence. You can find a number of prominent people and a number of uh, statements in newspapers and whatnot saying that the Declaration of Independence was the Bill of Rights. Indeed, Charles Sumner, leading abolitionist and then senator during Reconstruction, took this view. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who many of you know is the leading women's rights advocate of the 19th century, took this view. So that was a pretty common view. There were other people who argued that other parts of the Constitution were either a Bill of Rights or at least an equivalent of a National Bill of Rights. So you can find Supreme Court opinions in the 19th century that talked about Article I, Section 9 of the Constitution as being in the nature of a Bill of Rights because it contains a list of restrictions on the powers of Congress. Or that Article I, Section 10 was a kind of Bill of Rights for the states because it contained restrictions on what states could do. There were still other people who said only the first eight amendments were the Bill of Rights. And indeed, this is a line of thought that still had some adherence up until, uh, well, about 1970, roughly. In fact, Justice Black, who I mentioned earlier, was probably the last prominent person to take this view. Um, there were still others who said it was only the first nine amendments, excluding all, you know, excluding the tenth and including all the rest. Now, whatever you think about how people view the definition of the Bill of Rights, what is clear also is that nobody thought the first 10 amendments was special in any particular way, whatever they called it. Um, there's just no indication that people thought of it in the sort of iconic or exalted way that we think about it now. Um, now, I'll give you one point of evidence in favor of this interpretation or understanding. Um, when the centennial of the ratification of the Bill of Rights came around in 1891, Nothing happened, okay? There was no anniversary, no celebration, nothing. Now, you might look at that and think, well, okay, maybe back then people were more modest about the past achievements of America, and so this sort of thing didn't happen. But then you look and you see, okay, the centennial of the Declaration of Independence was marked by World's Fair and all sorts of national celebrations. And the centennial of the Constitution in 1887 was marked by a presidential speech and a speech by a Supreme Court justice and a big parade in Philadelphia. And there was also a celebration of the centennial of the first Congress in 1889 and the centennial of the federal judiciary. Okay? Everybody got their centennial moment in the sun except for the Bill of Rights because people didn't think that it either mattered 
or they didn't think we had a Bill of Rights. Thus, there was no centennial really to mark. Okay? Now, when does this begin to change? When do we start to approach where we are now? Well, the first step comes in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War. And there's a chapter in the book that's devoted to this. And basically, in the aftermath of that war, there was a considerable debate in the country about what rights, if any, should be extended to the newly conquered territories in the Philippines, in Guam, and in Puerto Rico. And as part of that conversation, there was a, an increasing tendency to refer to the things in the first set of amendments as being the Bill of Rights, and then trying to figure out, OK, well, which parts of what's in the first set of amendments ought to be applied to these newly conquered territories. So the result, sort of in the period from roughly 1898 until you approach the 1930s, is kind of uh, an increasing awareness that the first set of amendments, whether it's the first eight or the first 10, there was still some dispute, but that that, that was a Bill of Rights or the Bill of Rights, like the other contenders for that title sort of faded away. Um, but there was still no real special sense that the, this set of amendments was special or that it really represented what Justice Black would describe it as in 1937, the heart of the Constitution. Okay? The real breakthrough comes in the aftermath of the Great Depression. And Franklin Roosevelt plays a significant part in raising the status of the Bill of Rights through his use of the bully pulpit. Now, I'm going to talk about some of Roosevelt's Bill of Rights speeches. And I'm going to quote from some of them. None of them are the famous ones. That is, it is unlikely you've ever heard of any of these speeches, which is quite remarkable given what they say. Uh, in 1934, uh, Roosevelt gave one of his fireside chats on the radio and was responding to critics of the New Deal who were arguing that the expansion of the government, the federal government, under his watch was threatening individual liberty. So after spending a lot of time touting all the accomplishments that he said these programs were bringing, he, he got to the, his kind of central point in rejecting this criticism, and it was this, quote, have you lost any of your rights or liberty or constitutional freedom of action and choice? Turn to the Bill of Rights of the Constitution, which I have solemnly sworn to maintain and under which your freedom rests secure. Read each provision of that Bill of Rights and ask yourself whether you have personally suffered the impairment of a single jot of these great assurances. I have no question in my mind what your answer will be. I, I didn't want to try to attempt an FDR accent there while reading that quote. But now let's think about that passage for a second. In that passage, Roosevelt is using the Bill of Rights to justify an expansion of government. Now, this is the opposite of the way we think of the Bill of Rights now, which is all about limiting government. Okay, now, how, how did he manage this feat? Well, it's by equating freedom with the Bill of Rights. Right? So as long as something doesn't violate the Bill of Rights, then it doesn't violate your freedom. Now, of course, the problem with that is that's not the only definition of freedom. Right? There are lots of other ways one could understand freedom that go beyond the Bill of Rights or something less than the Bill of Rights. And indeed, if you had asked most people prior to the 1930s, I don't think they would have thought, in fact, I'm pretty confident, they would not have thought of the Bill of Rights as being the gold standard of freedom. Okay, that is a modern conceit. But there is a, a reason why there was an opening for making this argument when Roosevelt made it. And that's this. The Depression and the government response put great pressure on traditional constitutional doctrines, especially the ones that dealt with, let's say that, or well, essentially argued that Congress had quite limited enumerated powers under Article I, Section 8, and that property and contract rights were entitled to special protection under the Constitution. And with these 
sort of concepts sort of in retreat, uh, there was a vacuum. And the Bill of Rights was well positioned to fill that vacuum so long as it got a little bit of an assist from somewhere. And Roosevelt was part of the, the, the somewhere providing that, that boost to fill that vacuum. Now, a couple of years later, Roosevelt gave another speech uh, which emphasized the connection between the Bill of Rights and the New Deal. And this was his uh, Constitution Day address in 1937, which marked the 150th anniversary of the end of the Constitutional Convention. So just as there were all these centennial things in the late 19th century, in the late 1930s, early 1940s, there were all of these sesquicentennial events to mark the various landmarks of the founding. Um, so Roosevelt's speech was at the Washington Monument and also on radio nationally. And he basically proceeded to give an argument, at least in part of his speech, that said that support for the New Deal was necessary to save the Bill of Rights from destruction. Okay, so he said, quote, nothing would so surely destroy the substance of what the Bill of Rights protects than its perversion to prevent social progress. Desperate people in other lands surrendered their liberties when freedom came merely to mean humiliation and starvation. Okay. So again, in this passage, he's not talking so much about what the Bill of Rights protects. He's just saying it's an ideal, right? And to protect that ideal, we need more government programs. Okay? Which again is kind of contrary to the way that we think about it now. Uh, it's worth pointing out that in this speech, Roosevelt also said that the Bill of Rights supported his view that the federal government's powers over the economy were broad because he said, well, the Bill of Rights is very specific in its language as compared to the general broad language of Congress's powers under Article I, Section 8, okay? which is kind of, again, not a way, and I don't know that we think today that at least many parts anyway of the Bill of Rights are specific, right? Indeed, they, they might appear quite broad to us when we think about concepts like freedom of speech or free exercise of religion. Uh, there's a lot of dispute about what those things mean precisely because they are not quite so specific. But anyway, it was part and parcel of Roosevelt's use of the term. Now, of course, the other lands that he referred to where people had given up their liberties, we know what he was talking about. He was talking primarily about Europe, uh, and specifically Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. And it is fair to say that the rise of Hitler had a great deal to do with the increasing prominence of the Bill of Rights in discourse here. Because what you look, if you look at, say, newspaper references to the Bill of Rights or other references in popular culture to the first 10 amendments as the Bill of Rights, it really picks up sharply from 1937 on. And some of that can be attributed to Roosevelt. Some of that can be attributed to uh, changes in what the Supreme Court was doing after that point in relationship to the New Deal. But a fair bit of it also can be laid at the feet of Hitler. Now, how does that work? What, why did that happen? Well, I mean, you can see, I think, that the abuses going on in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, to the extent they were known, um, naturally increased attention on the equivalent rights here at home. Uh, made people think more about them, made people care more about them, and um, made people aware of the risk that was being posed to them by these foreign threats. And what you see is a response from uh, the media, from civic organizations, from groups all across American life where they start talking a lot more about the Bill of Rights, start talking a lot more about the first 10 amendments and some of the individual things in them, okay, in the shadow of this kind of gathering threat. Now, Roosevelt took this and used it in a speech he gave in 1939, which marked the, you guessed it, 150th anniversary of the first Congress and the first Congress having produced the draft of what became the Bill of Rights. A good deal of FDR's speech was focused on what the Bill of Rights that was drafted then contained. 
And he did this rather remarkable point-by-point uh, examination of key provisions in the first 10 amendments and then said, look how they are here as compared to how they are in the unnamed dictatorships of Europe. Okay? And, and this included a discussion of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly and petition, trial by jury, free exercise of religion, the right against unreasonable searches and seizures, and the taking of property by the government, which is not something we normally associate with FDR as, as being one of his prime concerns. But all of those provisions were quoted and re re you know, referred to in glowing terms and then compared to sort of the sort of terrible things that were going on both in Germany and in the Soviet Union. Um, this heightened awareness of the Bill of Rights for all of these reasons, continue to gather steam as we approach the Second World War. And as military preparedness sort of increased, a lot of the efforts to either increase the defense budget, bring in the first peacetime draft, and such, were justified on the grounds that we needed to do it to protect the Bill of Rights. Now again, these are all you know, exercises of government power that were being done in the name of the Bill of Rights, rather than limitations or restrictions on government power. In the summer of 1941, Congress decided to make the 150th anniversary of ratification of the Bill of Rights the first Bill of Rights Day. That was December 15th, 1941. Now, you all know what happened one week before that, right? So by sheer luck, if you want to call it that, the first Bill of Rights Day was also the first patriotic holiday after the beginning of the war. So it took on this special meaning for people because it was the first time they really could express what they were feeling about what had happened. Um, and this event was kind of a, quite the extravaganza across America. In made every city, you had parades, you had the Bill of Rights being read aloud, you had it being read by kids in schools, you had patriotic speakers, um, you even had kind of in New York, uh, uh, the, the Radio City musical Rockettes, you know, got involved in something that was related to the Bill of Rights. Um, and the highlight in the evening on December 15th was an hour-long radio program where they basically every Hollywood celebrity they could round up was asked to get involved and I would highly recommend that you listen to it it's on YouTube it's called we hold these truths it's mainly narrated by Jimmy Stewart although uh, Orson Welles and Lionel Barrymore also play a role in doing the narration and a lot of for those of you who, who like uh, Hollywood of this era, you know, you'll find it very interesting because a lot of people that you'll recognize sort of pop up in various scenes. And it is estimated that something close to half of all Americans heard it because it was aired on all national radio networks as a patriotic event. Okay? At the end of this program, the last 10 minutes or so, was given over to the president to give some remarks. Now, think a bit about the context in which these remarks were given before I'm going to quote a little bit from them. On December 7th, 1941, right, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And the next day, Roosevelt goes to Congress and asks for a declaration of war against Japan. Right? Now, not Germany. Three days after this declaration of war is given, Hitler gives a speech in the Reichstag in which he declares war on the United States. Basically because, well, they declared war on Japan, Japan's our ally, and besides, uh, Roosevelt's been working against us for a long time, blah, 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 blah. The remarks that Roosevelt gives on Bill of Rights Day are his first public response to the declaration of war by Hitler. And in a sense, it is his explanation for why we are fighting Hitler. 
because nothing's been said. I mean, of course, plenty was said before Pearl Harbor about the dangers of Hitler, but this was the first statement about this in the context of war. So here's how he begins, and then I'll quote a little bit more. No date in the long history of freedom means more to liberty-loving men in all liberty-loving countries than that 15th day of December, 1791. On that day, 150 years ago, a new nation, through an elected Congress, adopted a Declaration of Human Rights which has influenced the thinking of all mankind. Prior to the year 1933, the essential validity of the American Bill of Rights was accepted everywhere, at least in principle. But in that year, 1933, there came to power in Germany a political clique which did not accept the declarations of the American Bill of Human Rights. The entire program and goal of these political and moral tigers was nothing more than the overthrow throughout the earth of the great revolution of human liberty of which our American Bill of Rights is the mother charter. We will not, under any threat or in the face of any danger, surrender the guarantees of liberty our forefathers framed for us in our Bill of Rights." Unquote. So, in effect, the reason we're fighting Hitler is to save the Bill of Rights. Hitler is the enemy of the Bill of Rights. And the speech goes on at great length talking about, again, individual aspects of the Bill of Rights and how, more or less, they don't exist in Germany, and if Germany wins, they won't exist anywhere. Okay, so to, to take the uh, title of the old Frank Capra documentaries during World War II, this is like, why we fight, right? And wartime propaganda tended to emphasize the Bill of Rights as being one of the reasons why we needed to do all the things that we needed to do to fight Germany. And of course, many of those things involved government intervention, right? That is, we had government rationing, we had government, all sorts of government military measures that were being taken, again, in the name of the Bill of Rights to uh, fight the enemy and to, to, save, to save that text from destruction. It is really at this point that the Bill of Rights becomes the Bill of Rights and a symbol of unity for, for the country. Now, there, there's something important missing from most of the story I've just told you, and that is the Supreme Court, right? I mean, I made a couple of little references to the Supreme Court, but the work of making the Bill of Rights foundational to American constitutional culture was not done by the Supreme Court. Basically, up until about 1940, the Supreme Court rarely mentioned the Bill of Rights. And when it did, it did so in a kind of very offhand way that didn't really mean very much. Starting in the 1940s, all of a sudden, you know, you see a lot of references to the Bill of Rights in Supreme Court opinions and a lot of detailed discussion about how important it is and how central it was and so on. And I mean, I've got a chapter in the book about that. But it does remind one of the uh, adage that the Supreme Court sometimes is like the kicker in football, you know, like the offense did all the hard work and scored, and then the kicker sort of comes trotting on and kicks the extra point or kicks the field goal, right, and gets credit for scoring the points. Well, in fact, I mean, it's not clear how much really the kicker is doing other than validating what just happened, right? And in the case of the Bill of Rights, the Supreme Court is sort of late to the game or kind of following in the wake of these substantial changes that have come out of the political branches and the wider culture during the preceding few years uh, about the status or role of the Bill of Rights in America. Now, um, this brings me sort of to a kind of some closing thoughts about kind of what, what sh does this aspect of the story of the Bill of Rights tell us or how should we think about it? And I, and I think the way I want to frame it is to say, um, what is the price of the creation of this symbol of unity for the country? Is it too high? Right? And here's what I mean by that. Later on during World War II, uh, FDR gave a speech in which he argued for uh, the establishment of all sorts of basically government entitlements for America after the end of the war. 
uh, which became part of what the GI Bill of Rights was, but involved things like education, health care, a job, and so on. Okay? And he described this list as the second Bill of Rights. You know, we need a second Bill of Rights to go beyond what the first Bill of Rights uh, has because the first Bill of Rights only deals with limits on government power. It doesn't deal with sort of empowering citizens and providing them sustenance. Now, the thing is, to say that that had to be a second Bill of Rights implies strongly that the first Bill of Rights cannot be changed. Right? It's fixed forever as the first ten amendments, no more, no less. Right? Now, of course, it wasn't always thus. Right? I mean, the Constitution does not say that the, what the Bill of Rights is, and in our history, as I've explained, there have been many different definitions. The problem with saying that the Bill of Rights can only be the first ten amendments, no more, no less, is that it's both over-inclusive and under-inclusive. So what I mean by that is there are some things in the first ten amendments that we don't think are particularly important now. Or you might think are overemphasized merely because they are part of this collection known as the Bill of Rights. For example, I mean, it's easy to pick on the Third Amendment, which talks about the government's inability to quarter troops in your house during wartime, okay, though none of us would particularly want troops to be quartered in our homes during wartime. Um, but, I mean, a more pertinent example might be the uh, grand jury indictment requirement in the Fifth Amendment, which nobody today really thinks of as being an important safeguard uh, for uh, federal criminal defendants. I mean, and it's fine to say that it should be enforced because it's in the Constitution, but to say that it should have this exalted status as part of the Bill of Rights, you might think to be just inaccurate or uh, posing something of a problem. Now, likewise, there are things that are not in the first ten amendments that are very important, and they're not part of the Bill of Rights. The right to vote would be one, okay? Um, now, does it matter that the right to vote is excluded from the Bill of Rights? Well, not necessarily, right? I mean, you could give it its own special name or its own special designation, but at the same time, if you're saying that the Bill of Rights is something special, right, to say that it can never be changed would, would suggest first that we are not able to dis make a different set of decisions about what's special or what's important in, a, in, that, in that way anyway uh, from what was done before. But also there's just the fact that it might suggest that all the great achievements happened long ago. Right? I mean, part of what makes the first ten amendments different is they all came from the founding generation. And that's all well and good, but they weren't the only ones to make important contributions to the American Constitution. As uh, anyone who looks at the Emancipation Proclamation and then the Reconstruction Amendments can tell you. So, you know, the, the book closes by asking, you know, should we be rethinking the question of whether the first Ten Amendments, no more, no less, is the Bill of Rights and must always be. But there is a problem with changing any tradition, okay, especially one that has unifying power. Well, are you going to lose the unifying power of that symbol or of that thing if you start changing it? Now, this is a challenge for all sorts of legal and political systems everywhere, right? You know, you have a tradition. Is the best way of sort of holding faith with that tradition to leave it unchanged, don't touch it, right? Or to try to adapt it intelligently to whatever current needs or demands there are. Now, I don't pretend to have an answer to that question, okay? But it, it struck me as I re reached the end of this research that no one even asked the question anymore as to what should the Bill of Rights be. It's just taken as a given that it's the first ten amendments. Now, it is said by people that, um, you know, judges make complicated problems simple and professors make simple problems complicated, right? So if that's true, then the simple problem of what is the Bill of Rights, I've just tried to complicate for you 
by saying it isn't necessarily or doesn't have to be the first 10 amendments. So uh, with that, I, uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Um, I'm told that uh, questions must come from the microphones on both sides because we are uh, doing video for, uh, for YouTube. So um, when people get to the mics, I will sort of just point. Okay, and I'll start over here with you. A wonderful talk. Two brief questions. You've not mentioned the Second Amendment at all. And Roosevelt began to speak, I think he was the first president ever to do so, of freedom from want, whatever that might be. So you could say, can we really have political freedom if we don't have economic freedom? Right, okay. So on the Second Amendment, the first thing to say is, other than people who just list all of the amendments, okay, when they're talking about the Bill of Rights, you really don't see much said about the Second Amendment in connection with the Bill of Rights until President Bush 41 gives a speech on the bicentennial of the Bill of Rights in 1991. Now, there, there's an interesting twist to that, which is that just as the 150th anniversary of the Bill of Rights fell right after Pearl Harbor, the 200th anniversary came right before the end of the Soviet Union. So the speech that Bush gives is about kind of the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. I mean, he doesn't quite know that the Soviet Union is about to be dissolved, but I mean, there's a lot of changes already happened at that point. And in his talk about the Bill of Rights, he talks about the Second Amendment as being something that uh, has helped to preserve respect for the armed forces among the American people. And that, indeed, he gives a kind of um, civilian control of the military reading to some of the provisions of the first ten amendments, the second and third amendments especially. Um, so before that, you don't really see anything. Now, on the other hand, you could say, well, by 1991, the second amendment plays a more prominent role in American constitutional culture than it had at other periods. So that sort of makes sense. I mean, you know, the other thought I'll throw out about the Second Amendment is um, certainly for those who believe in the Second Amendment strongly, that enhances the legitimacy of the Bill of Rights, that it's in there, right? Now, does that have some sort of feedback or uh, kind of uh, other effect on the other provisions of the Bill of Rights? That is, are you more likely to believe in other parts of the Bill of Rights because the Second Amendment's in the Bill of Rights and you believe strongly in the Second Amendment? Well, maybe, or at least maybe modestly, uh, but I mean, that's harder for me to say. Now, on the um, freedom from want, yes, I mean, Roosevelt did talk about that. Of course, he had this formulation of the four freedoms uh, during his 1941 State of the Union where he talked about freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from fear, freedom from want, um, <clears throat> immortalized by Norman Rockwell. And the second Bill of Rights that he proposed later on during the war was geared towards this freedom from want idea. And, in, and what's interesting about that is that when um, President Bush 41 gave his speech in 1991, he talked about how the Bill of Rights is an express rejection of the idea that government should convey positive benefits through the Constitution. That, in fact, the framers uh, were wise to understand that government should simply be limited, right, and that everything else should be left to the democratic process. So, now again, you could say, well, that reflects political changes from 1944 to 1991, but it also just reflects that both interpretations can kind of find room within the broad concept of a Bill of Rights to be made. They're just coming at it from different points of view. Yes, sir. So it seems that using Roosevelt as an example to promote <laughs> the emergence of the Bill of Rights is somewhat contradictory with history. Madison who drew heavily on the Virginia Compact and the Virginia Constitution in drafting the Bill of Rights, was an anti-federalist, and was more interested in states' rights. Up until the time that he delivers his speech that you refer to, uh, Roosevelt had been, a lot of the New Deal legislation had been struck down by the Supreme Court 
as being violative of this Commerce Clause and of being a, a, an expansion of federal government beyond the limited government conceived of and drafted by the founders. Roosevelt himself threatens the Supreme Court with packing the Supreme Court and gets the chicken coop case expanding the Commerce Clause, which leads to the substantial expansion of the federal power. Roosevelt suspends civil liberties with respect to Japanese American, Japanese American citizens. And Roosevelt does nothing to advance the Bill of Rights itself other than to use it for political fodder. It doesn't really become the bastion of what it is today until we see the Warren Court and the incorporation doctrine that occurs in the 1950s and 1960s. I don't know why we would focus that the Bill of Rights would be something that we, I would, you would credit to a Roosevelt when nothing that he did within his administration seemed to be promoting the objectives of constitutional liberties and the limitation of government power. Right. So let's separate out two different things. One is sort of the status of the Bill of Rights in American life, and then the other is what does it mean, right? So, in effect, why does the Bill of Rights come to mean what we now understand it to mean about limiting government and enhancing civil liberties? So, some of that work is done by the Supreme Court uh, in opinions that begin even before World War II is over, where they talk about the Bill of Rights in a very different way from the way Roosevelt talked about it. And they're talking about it as being something that means that fundamental rights are not things that are put up for a vote. They are things that are the special province of the courts. And that is also part of uh, the court's effort to sort of uh, shore up its own authority following the clash that it had had on, you know, on the losing side, basically, with Roosevelt's New Deal. The other thing which I, I didn't have time to get to was the Cold War played an important role as well. So when Truman comes in and the Cold War really begins, um, talking about the Bill of Rights as something that limits government and especially its limitations with respect to religion become very important in the way the government tries to respond to the threat of international communism. And so you don't see Roosevelt saying anything very strong about communism because of the wartime alliance with Stalin. But Truman, within a couple of years of the end of the Second World War, is giving frequent speeches in which he's talking about the Bill of Rights as what makes us different from the Russians. Okay? Now, as uh, David mentioned at the beginning uh, during his introduction, the big speech that was given in that uh, vein came right here at the National Archives on Bill of Rights Day in 1952 when they put everything together in the rotunda and the president spent a lot of time talking about the importance of the Bill of Rights in connection with the fight against communism and that basically if we held true to the civil liberties that were in the Bill of Rights, then we would prevail in the fight against the Soviet Union. So it's fair to say that Roosevelt raised the status of the Bill of Rights, but for a different purpose than the purpose that, that we know today, and that others that then built on that status to sort of give it the meaning that we, that we hold to it. And again, to some extent, it was a contingent because the Cold War raised different problems and different challenges than World War II had raised. Uh, at least in the eyes of, uh, of most federal officials. I mean, I should note that, of course, another thing that comes out of the Cold War is the idea that the Bill of Rights is not a suicide pact. That's another idea which was injected, which is still sort of around, although kind of in a not, n never quite made it into the mainstream, but I mean, most people know the phrase, right? Um, but that was certainly the minority view, you might say, for the most part, uh, in thinking about the Cold War's use of the, of the Bill of Rights and how we should think about that. Um, yes. So <clears throat> my question is about the applicability of the Bill of Rights to actions by state governments. So was it totally clear to people, when, or the Congress and the states when they ratified it, that it didn't apply to state governments? And conversely, the adoption of the 14th Amendment, was that clear that it 
did apply to state government, so that was only later through actions by the Supreme Court. Okay, so on the first part of your question, it, it was pretty clear at the time, uh, at 17, 1791, that the Bill of Rights applied only to the federal government. Now, part of the way we know that is because Madison tried to have a provision introduced as an amendment that would have expressly limited the states from doing certain things, and that was rejected by Congress, or by the House of Representatives. Uh, so, uh, you know, then the Supreme Court later issued an opinion in which they basically said, well, it, everybody kind of knew, whether that was true or not, but enough people knew that, in fact, the first set of amendments were not meant to limit the states. Now, it is certainly true that um, some important people at the time of the ratification of the 14th Amendment believed that the Bill of Rights, that it, or what they described as the Bill of Rights, to the extent they used that term at all, should apply to the actions of the states. Now, whether you want to say that that represented a consensus of Congress or the states that ratified the 14th Amendment, that's a much harder question. Um, but it is fair to say that there was, that view was, that argument was made with some force, and uh, it took, though, a long time for that to be embraced by the Supreme Court, in part because of, you know, the strong hold that states' rights had on people, as well as the fact that by extending the provisions of the first set of amendments of the states, you were really changing the balance of federal state power in a way that was pretty dramatic. So it just took a long time for that to really take hold. And indeed, you see some of that happening in the years prior to the 1930s, okay, but the bulk of it happens sort of after the Bill of Rights becomes just much more prominent generally. Now, you might say that there's some cause and effect there, that the increase in the status of the Bill of Rights may have contributed to the thought that, hey, it ought to apply to the states as well as the federal government, but that's a little harder to pin down. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yes, sir. I think it's very interesting what you've said about the evolution of the, the uh, concept and how, uh, and the changing of the concept of what, what the Bill of Rights means. But, and you said Madison never, never thought of it as a Bill of Rights. But so, but also I'm interested in that early history. I mean, it mu those rights must have had great power uh, in the minds of the founding fathers, if the, you know there were ten of them. And Madison drafted them, and they were just, and they were passed very quickly. I mean, th those rights themselves must have been very important and had a lot of power, even though they didn't call them the Bill of Rights. I mean, is that uh, fair? Well, you know, it's interesting because if you look at the debates that occurred in the first Congress, most of the members, or at least many of them, said, "Why are we, why are we spending our time on this? Like, don't we have more important things to do? You know, setting up the government and right. and whatnot." And Madison was the one who was most insistent that it be done. Now, some of that had to do with the fact that he kind of promised that it would be done when he ran for Congress and kind of had to promise that in order to get elected. But also, um, Madison was concerned that if you didn't pass something like what the first 10 amendments became, that there would be uh, calls for another constitutional convention uh, and just general kind of instability. Um, now, you know, the ratification kind of happened, and then there wasn't really much commentary about it. Now, in one sense, that was a, a sign of the success of the political strategy of putting them through, because calls for a second convention just kind of disappeared after that. Um, you know, the reason that people didn't, or an important reason why people didn't call it a Bill of Rights is because the first 10 amendments did not look like the state bills of rights. State bills of rights looked very different in this period from what the first 10 amendments are. Uh, in particular, first, state bills of rights, and indeed, indeed state bills of rights now, to a large extent, if you go look at them, have this, a lot of rhetoric in them that's reminiscent of the Declaration of Independence, talking about natural rights and popular sovereignty and first principles of government before they go into the specific things that they're going to limit. The first 10 amendments don't really do that uh, much or, or hardly at all. The other thing is, state bills of rights came at the very beginning of their constitutions. They were sort of meant to be kind of the starting point, right? The first 10 amendments came at the end. 
right? So for a lot of people, it wasn't a Bill of Rights because it didn't look like a Bill of Rights that they were familiar with. Now, today, we don't really think of whether something's a Bill of Rights because of those sorts of criteria. We look at it more as, well, what is it doing? Or, you know, just is what it's doing something that we think important, right? So they had, a, I guess you could say, a more formal way of looking at it. Though one might say that to say, as we do, that only the first 10 amendments, no more, no less, can be the Bill of Rights is also a very formal way of looking at it. Like, well, why is that exactly? Why can't other things be included? Um, so, I mean, it was important to the politics of the time, but that didn't translate over into calling it a Bill of Rights or the Bill of Rights. Professor Barnett. Hi, Gerard. Uh, I really uh, look forward to reading the book. Uh, I, as you know, I'm already very sympathetic with the thesis of the book. Uh, and your last answer anticipates much of what I was going to ask. Uh, I was going to point out that in his uh, speech introducing the amendments, uh, which we call the Bill of Rights speech, but that's just something we call it, uh, Madison uh, is talking about the proposals that he lists, and he says the first of these could be considered as a Bill of Rights. And then if you look and see what the first of these were, it was the language that he proposed be added to the preamble, which would go into the beginning, consistent with what you've just said. And it was language that echoed the Virginia Declaration of Rights that ended up getting picked, with, that George Mason wrote, that ended up getting picked up and put into four or so state constitutions, including the Massachusetts Constitution, where it was used as the basis for abolishing slavery. Um, in Massachusetts that the Supreme Judicial Court there abolished slavery on the basis of this language that was in its Declaration of Rights. Um, so first of all, that gives rise to the possible reason why that language was not included into the federal constitution, because it had already proven to be quite dangerous uh, to the slave interests. Um, uh, and uh, it also suggests what was thought to be a Bill of Rights and why this one wasn't, and that is it was a declaration of fundamental natural rights, which was pervasive throughout uh, the state constitutions as well as elsewhere. So I was going to ask you to say some more about it. You've already said something about it in response to the last question, but I don't know how much more of that is covered in the book that you might want to add now. Well, the only thing that, that, that I'll, I'll thank you for the question, and the only thing I'll add is that you might wonder, well, why didn't they put a Bill of Rights in the Constitution to begin with, right? If it was so important to so many people, why didn't the framers anticipate that? And one possible answer is that they, some of them, or enough of them, in the Constitutional Convention were concerned that any language like that would have implications for slavery. And indeed, um, you know, one of the South Carolina, the Pinckneys from uh, South Carolina, um, said when he, after the convention, well, look, um, most bills of rights say something about people being equal, and well, people aren't all equal because we have slaves, so how can we say that? You know, now, and of course, even when the amendments were, were ratified, they didn't have any language that was equivalent to the Declaration of Independence or what later came in the Equal Protection Clause. So, um, so I think th th it may help explain a little bit about why you didn't see anything like that in the original proposal. Well, thank you. Uh, do we have time for one more? We're, one more? Out of time. Out of time. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much for coming.